Hi, this is Professor Doyle. How are you today? It's good to be with you again. We're on Chapter 5, uh, Power and Influence. And I, uh, as I was thinking about this, uh, this uh, what I wanted to say to you um, that might uh, prove helpful as you get through the material, um, I got to thinking about the whole topic of, uh, as we have in this chapter, power and influence and what that means. Uh, the thing I like to, I guess, out of the bag to uh, share with you is that uh, power is for me like a magic wand. It uh, sort of lays around and I found in organizations that uh, that the power is there and it's important for leaders to um, pick up that power and use it and not be scared of it. You know, Power is, is sort of a funny word uh, and uh, the formal word for it we call in organizations is the authority. Each position is vested with the authority to get the job done. Uh, for example, if you're the chief financial officer of the organization, you have been given the authority to oversee all the financial and accounting uh, processes and programs, initiatives within the organization. You know, you may even be responsible for trust accounting, that is uh, the value of money that is placed uh, in accounts and, how ye and the yield of that. So all organizations uh, empower, if you will, uh, positions with the with uh, with uh, the requisite amount of power to, in order to get the job done. <clears throat> so power is not a negative word. It uh, can be a negative word because so, we know that people misuse power. Our history of the earth is full of leaders who uh, do that all the time. Um, there is a great quote by Lenin who said, the true leader must submerge himself in the fountain of the people. That is, the, the leader must be part of the people, must come out of the people. And, and, and it's the people, by that definition, that sort of empower the individual uh, as a leader to best represent them and, and what they are doing. Of course, in organizations, we know that there is a selection process that we've been talking about uh, of that individual as well. Power has been formally defined as the capacity to produce effects on others or the potential to influence others. And we've been talking uh, through the lectures about the importance of followers uh, or uh, <coughs> situational characteristics that may diminish or enhance a character's potential to influence followers. So there is definitely, if you have leadership, you have to have followers. Um, <clears throat> and power, uh, by definition, does not always need to be exercised uh, in order to have its, uh, have its effect on individuals. So, you know, power it comes with these positions. Uh, power in its best form is utilized for the good uh, of the mission and the vision and the values of the organization. And, and there is a can be within leaders that I have seen um, uh, sometimes uh, where they get to believe that they and the organization are one and the same and that um, um, they confuse the fact that they have that power because they're in the position they think it's because of them. So it's, uh, it's power is a funny thing. Uh, Machiavelli uh, once wrote a book, uh, a 16th century philosopher who said absolute power corrupts absolutely. So there, there is this uh, seduction of power with individuals that can happen and I think for leaders it's actually one of the more critical areas they need to be constantly aware of and how they use that power productively uh, towards the ends of the organization. Um, power uh, of course is attributed to others on the basis and frequency of influence tactics, that is they use uh, influence that uh, comes with that power and their outcomes. Um, <clears throat> power is given to positions uh, in which people now have access to things that they did not have access as leaderships are promoted. They have access. I, at one time I worked for a gentleman uh, when I was the president of a company uh, which uh, he had access to the President of the United States and uh, he could pick up the phone and call that is uh, access power is really, really, uh, really powerful. Um, so um, people in power positions have influence um, and we've defined influence in this text as the, uh, the change in a target agent's 
attitudes, values, beliefs, or behavior as a result of influence tactics. So um, power is comes with these positions. Uh, it, it, uh, power can be uh, measured by the uh, by the behaviors and attitudes manifested by followers. Um, so we can always gauge uh, exactly you know the power of an individual by how 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 people who are followers have responded and 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 how the impact of the leader's influence on those people can, can be can be measured so you know leaders can cause fairly substantial changes in subordinates attitudes and behaviors if they are positive and if they are negative uh, the amount of power followers have in work situations can also uh, vary dramatically uh, I have seen situations where some of the best leaders are those who uh, who are very confident and secure in themselves and delegate at that power to others uh, you know uh, in the form of authority and and I think in a better run organization that's done deliberately it's done methodically it's done very planned and so that's really how an organizations work is through delegated power uh, and, and 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 equipping people uh, to be able to perform uh, in those roles. Now, there are sources of power in organizations that the book goes into. I don't know if I want to talk about those. You know, the, the, the type of office, the choice of clothing, uh, presence or absence of uh, crises in the organization, and so forth. Uh, but I, I think that you know the the book also goes into other parts in terms of uh, how uh, leaders um, in a sort of a leader follower framework or work in relationship to each other in terms of rewards, uh, legitimizing the work that goes on, and um, being ever focused as uh, important to be on the situation in which they are all working within. Again, the external environment situation and the situation within the organization uh, day by day as events and uh, activities flow that they, they, uh, they as leaders and followers are always very much focused on. Um, <clears throat> now there are different kinds of power. One is uh, expert power. This is the power of knowledge. Um, I think you would probably find that in academic settings, um, you know, with uh, most of uh, people who have been in academia and are very knowledge focused, that uh, that would be sort of an expert power. In organizations, there are people obviously that are expert within their area. Uh, that can be at any level in the organization. Um, their ability, you know, their expert knowledge of law, their legal, uh, finance, accounting, engineering, uh, and uh, some leaders have expert knowledge about leadership. So um, that's that's one source of power. The other sort of that the source that the book references called referent power. Referent power refers to the potential influence one has due to the strength of the relationship between the leader and the follower. So um, uh, usually with preferred power, it takes time to develop. It's very uh, relationship-based, and uh, referent power would be people who, you know, would uh, know others, let's say, that they can connect people to. So it's a referent power to me is a very collaborative sort of power model in which uh, <coughs> they can leverage their relationship uh, within and outside of organizations and influence people. Um, we have uh, a lot of people, for example, in Washington, D.C., who are very well known that are, uh, <clears throat> that work within the government uh, or they're outside of government uh, that are lobbyists, and the lobbyists would, would be a good example of a referent power, uh, where they're there to influence legislation and what goes on in Washington and bringing the various groups together and are representing uh, their employers or they're under contract, let's say, a particular organization who wants to lobby for a particular kind of bill. There is legitimate power, uh, and that is roughly defined as uh, a person's organizational role, uh, and that carries with it a title, and that title, of course, uh, has a job description, and that job description lays out the job duties and responsibilities. So it's uh, holding a position. Uh, and then being a leader, by the way, is not necessarily synonymous because you can have people that have the title but are not really recognized as leaders. Uh, 
effective leaders often intuitively realize they need more than legitimate to power to be successful. Um, and so, you know, what, what I think the character of leadership strives for is, is over and above just the legitimate power that is that comes with the title to truly be leaders and people would recognize that that person is someone they really want to follow, if you follow me. So, so there, there is a, are people following the leader? Are they uh, confident in the leader's abilities? Is the leader performing and getting results like it is? Are they using their influence? And so uh, the legitimate power allows ex exertion of influence through request or demands deemed appropriate by the role, by virtue of the role and the position. So <clears throat> it's uh, very important to recognize that there is a striving, there needs to be a striving with leaders to be ever mindful about their acquiring uh, influence uh, that goes beyond just their position. Another form of power is uh, reward power. Uh, reward power involves the potential to influence others due to one's control over desired resources. You know, the potential to influence others through reward power is sort of a joint function of the leader, the followers, and the situation. Uh, you know, extrinsic reward, rewards may not have the same effects on behavior as intrinsic rewards. So, reward power would be uh, in an organization, uh, let's say you have um, uh, in a formal organization a, uh, a board member who, uh, who has uh, a particular um, kitty of money, if you will, uh, pertaining to them as a board member in that organization and, um, and uh, they are there to reward someone inside the organization that has done something. Uh, uh, that that person can reward them on. Uh, so there's, you know, reward power is, is almost independent of the organization, but yet it's, it can't sit within the organization. And uh, there's a great influence with reward power. Uh, it might be, for example, an investor who's looking to invest money in a particular organization that brings, uh, uh, you know, a, a large or, say, a significant amount of money, as an example. To, to invest in an organization. So um, leaders can, uh, under reward power, uh, enhance their ability to influence others based on reward, reward power if they determine what rewards are available, determine what rewards are valued by their subordinates, uh, establish clear policies for equitable and consistent administration of those rewards for good performance. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think it's fair to say that uh, any uh, position of power, uh, positional power, also carries with it uh, reward power if uh, the leader is in a position of having something to reward people about, okay? Uh, followers may exercise reward power over leaders by controlling administration of scarce, scarce resources. This is particularly true of the government. Uh, and <clears throat> so leaders, you know, uh, don't always have access to reward power. And in some organizations, that's, that's held by administrators. So there's another form of power, and that's coercive power, and that's the potential, the potential to influence others through the administration of negative sanctions or the removal of positive events. Uh, you know, reliance on coercive power has inherent limitations and drawbacks. Um, <clears throat> so uh, followers can use this kind of influence over this uh, kind of coercive power to influence their leader's behavior um, um, <clears throat> and more likely to use this power by followers when a relatively high amount of referent power exists among co-workers. So coercive power um, is within organizations and um, it has, it's, it's, it's there um, though let um, me give an example would be a uh, uh, legal counsel within an organization uh, that has no clear authority, let's say over a line manager, uh, someone responsible for assets and revenues, uh, but has coercive power. Uh, that is, they can, they can, uh, you know, they can uh, damage or sanction or punish uh, that manager based on performance. Uh, the human resource laws in the United States are a good example of that. <clears throat> so these are just uh, a few of the 
uh, areas of power within organizations and in closing um, we recognize that effective leaders typically take advantage of all their sources of power and leaders in well-functioning organizations are open to being influenced by their subordinates too so I don't want to leave you with the impression that power always flows top down it comes in from the side and it comes up in from the bottom and leaders vary and to the extent in which they share power with their subordinates and we think effective leaders generally work to increase their various power bases or becoming more willing to use their coercive power. So in closing, I hope this has been a helpful uh, uh, lecture for you. Thank you.